Are you looking for a fun and informative podcast all about training working dogs? Look no further than the LWDG Pod Dog. This weekly show is hosted by me, Joanne Perrot, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I chat to experienced trainers and experts in the field who will give you helpful tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or you've been working dogs for years, this podcast will have something for you. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and tune in to LWDG Pod Dog, and let us help you build a better bond with your best friend. Hello and welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week we're going to be talking about is your gun dog ready for the shooting season? Joining me for this amazing topic is LWDG Group expert M Stevens. How are you, Emma? I'm good, thank you, Joe. Before we get started, Emma, would you like to give the listeners a little bit of a background? Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Emma Stevens. I run Cunning Shot Dog Training, which is based, we've got two branches, one in the East Midlands and one in Cumbria. We do pet gun dog and working gun dog training for puppies all the way up to competition level. Fantastic. And you are living, working, breathing on a shooting estate, is that correct? Yes, so I'm a wife of a gamekeeper. Between the two of us, we have just shy of about 20 dogs <laughs> um so they they are kenneled and and live in the house as well so we've got a big mix of kind of job roles lifestyles um for all of them as well so I just thought I'd come on and hopefully give some insight into when your dog's ready because I remember what that was like and even now the pups coming through it's like oh are they ready are they not ready and, and kind of what to look for well the shooting season is in full swing and if you're a gun dog owner like you said we want to make sure our dogs are ready for it because it's, it's a big jump from the training field to the absolute like being out there in the shooting field everything going on what let's start with what do we look for generally in a well-trained gun dog so for me i would say it it also depends on kind of the job roles um they do kind of mix into each other um but for a beating dog so that's the dog that's that's kind of in the beating line flushing pheasants towards the guns um in your normal standard driven shoots which i'll explain a little bit more about as well um you're looking for steadiness um really good level of obedience so for me that would be heel work good sits and weights for for long durations you may be required to hold lines for for a long time while guns get ready um the keeper might be being told to do different things so you need to be able to multitask and and rely on your dog that they're under control and staying under control hunt pattern depends on the ground terrain that you're on so again that's going to be a little bit of education for for you as an owner as to what a pattern should look like based on different ground terrain as well and what would be required of them in that. So a hunt pattern into heel work and then back into hunt patterns and things like that would be essential for me. And then obviously that stop to movement, stop to flush, because we don't want any dogs, any dogs chasing anything. Now, for a lot of people listening to you, they're already probably thinking, oh my God, how do we even train these things? A lot of these things, you are one of the experts involved in the Hot Mess Handler. We cover these sort of um, topics in depth in there, don't we? So we've done a time in a podcast to go through all those those things you mentioned, but they, if anybody listening can go watch that and know exactly what you mean by what you just said. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the the terminology bits are, are kind of they're all explained and things and, and steadiness and exercises and stuff like that that you can be building to get your dog up to that level. Um, I think the biggest, obviously, the, the terminology bits that I explained was obviously your the the beating line as such and a driven shoot day. So beaters are the people that push birds towards guns. Driven is just the style of shooting where you're literally driving birds towards guns and over the top of them, um, as opposed to walked up where you're walking with the with the birds being flushed and you're shooting away from you rather than birds flying at you. So they're just the main differences in that. But the hunting side of it from a beating dog is very, very similar. Steadiness, control, heel work, stop whistle. They're, they're your biggest tips for me. Why is steadiness so important? I think partly because it's overlooked. I don't think it's done enough. Um, I think people go, right, my dog can sit. That's it. Let's move on to something fancy. Um, and it is so needed on a shoot day 
for so many different reasons. You've got to navigate fences. You've got to get them on and off beaters buses. You've got long periods of waiting around, whether that's being social or whether that's waiting for guns to get ready or uh, pickers up to finish after drives. You've got areas where you need to be sitting and waiting throughout the drive because maybe there's been a big flush and you need to get your dog back and sitting next to you and things and then like I said when ground terrain changes as well that might that might depend on how how you're actually then working your dog so that steadiness almost needs to be automatic by the time you get to a shoot day so that you can concentrate on where you're walking where you're climbing listening to the keeper telling you what to do walking in the line making sure that people either side of you are are walking straight where you're meant to be and things like that as well so at that point you need to be able to for short periods of time switch off your dog and trust them that they're they're going to do their bit and that comes from that ultimate steadiness and self-control from from puppy on a shoot day there is um how can i say it there is almost a feeling of controlled chaos isn't it so you're trying to keep up with the day in your in your own right without having to check every 30 seconds where is my dog yeah and equally the worst thing can be you on a shoot day being the one that's nagging at your dog sit stay get here get here what's this and whistles and stop whistles and heal and repeating commands because you're going to annoy yourself and you're going to nag your dog in already a heightened environment where they're already conflicted about listening to you versus what's going on in the environment as well and also you're going to be nervous as well especially if it's your first day out as well you're going to be so nervous about your dog being under control in that point that's going to feed down to them as well so you need to be able to kind of like be that lovely graceful swan on the surface and (laughs) paddling like hell where actually nobody knows what's what's going on in in your head as well and even your dog needs to not know that bit of of what's going on either they need to think that you're calm collected and in control and when we're on an estate you know it's it's great for a dog to have been steady at home in your local park while you threw around dummies and then when you go on an estate, it's a big jump for a dog to suddenly have all the sights, all the smells, all the noise, all that stuff going on. It's a huge attack on the uh, senses, isn't it? Yeah, and there's ways that you can kind of prep, prepare your dogs for that as well and prep them for it. So for me, beating or picking up, my massive requirements are that they have heard shot. They have seen things move either along the floor or in the air and are steady to that. So they are able to sit and watch it happen and not need to chase it. They need to have seen a beater's flag as well and had that nice and up close because you may be given one on a day. And if your dog's never seen it before, it's then it's another new thing for them. So we're just, we're just trying to prevent and limit the exposure to new things on that day because the day in itself is going to be new. So anything that we can do to make that dog be like oh, okay yeah I've seen that before I've got that that doesn't need to freak me out or scare me or over excite me I've seen that that's copable and I can manage my behavior based on having seen that before cold game is another one beaters bit for beating dogs and for picking up dogs they need to have seen cold game lying on the floor if you don't ever want them to pick it up they need to have been able to just sort of like hunt over it and if you do want them to pick it up they need to obviously be able to retrieve it and bring it back to you nicely. And obviously we can only do that with cold game. We can't do that with, with live game, and, game until the day. Um, ground scent of cold game as well um, can kind of start to mimic what your dog would look like on that live scent as well can, can be really helpful. Um, exposure to large vehicles. So if, if you do live in kind of a suburban area and you don't really see tractors and things like that, try and get them out to more rural areas where they can be up close to tractors because they're going to be more likely to be tractors and quad bikes are going to be kind of your your bread and butter of shoot day transport and if a dog's never been I don't need to they don't necessarily need to have been on a trailer but at least if they've heard tractors and been up close that can really help as well um and then piles of birds and birds in people's hands that's another big thing that I see dogs completely lose their head over is that when people are exchanging and and passing birds between each other and stuff the dogs cannot cope with the with the live birds or the well the, the dead birds at that point but warm game being passed between people and tied up and braced up and things like that as well so that's another thing and piles on the floor of beds because they'll be kind of lined out and braced and then put onto game carts so those kind of things can help a dog really just calm down um, if they've been exposed to that before and then the last is the social aspect of it 
we know that people like to socialize on shoots that's the whole point of them um so things where there's like loads of food so i take mine to pubs for that because they need to learn that food being handled and passed around and stuff they don't need to jump at it same with drinks being passed around and things like that as well so they're kind of the biggest kind of top tips as such i can remember when my dog saw a beater's flag for the first time and you don't think about it until the season starts um but they're really noisy on there so for anybody who is listening who hasn't seen a beater's flag you can get really professional ones or you can have what most people have which i think is like either a stick or a piece of alkathene pipe with a feed bag tied to it <laughs> with a bit of bail cord you can quite easily make ones y- yourselves um but the noise of of definitely of a feed bag is like it's like a banging whistly type of noise isn't it and it's like it's like a really f- loud flappy noise if you've got wind it, it could be something that if a dog's not seen or heard it's going to be a bit of a shock to their system yeah definitely and and things like when I've got dogs coming through clients dogs as well coming through and starting to get ready for those sorts of days we'll do heel work with them cracking a flag because that might be required it might be that your birds are really jumpy on a shoot day and the keeper's gone right everybody get your dogs back and we're just going to walk them instead of using the dogs to push them and at that point your dog's going to have to be quite close to you with you cracking this flag next to them and like you say the feed bags or, or the kind of more professionally made ones they could they can give quite a crack out um and obviously then they rustle as well and if you use them to pick your way through paths and stuff like that as well you're using that flag against other objects and things tapping is another thing so if you're ever put on what's called a stop um where you're kind of you're put in an area that's quite close to a flush point and you're there to just stop the birds pushing into an area maybe that the keeper doesn't want them in that again is where your steadiness comes in that your dog will have to sit with you pretty much for the whole drive at your side with you banging and flagging and and doing everything to push the birds the right way and they're not even required to do anything at that point there's no hunting involved there's no heel work you're literally stationary um and again those sorts of things can really throw dogs and that's why the the steadiness and the exposure to shoot day equipment um is really important to to me that i kind of try and pass on to everybody you mentioned some things there they like you said you can definitely get them really really ready for them if you're innovative in your approach in the run up to shooting season things like getting in and out of a trailer getting in and out of um a mule hearing a quad bike you know there are ways you can find people who've got these things at their access and maybe you could just like go sit and listen to quad bikes or something where the dog isn't suddenly got a day where it gets out of your car and then it's got quad bikes coming past their mules coming past their trailers tractors all these sights all these smells all these different people all these noises because it's that point where when you've blown their mind your all your training all your work everything is lost at that isn't it yeah, so you could you'll almost setting yourself up to fail from the minute you get your dog out of the dog box because there we know that everything everything new that you throw at them obviously just depreciates their level of concentration and control. So you could have the the best dog in the world in a training field that is ready temp, temperament wise and and training wise for a shoot day, yet they haven't experienced all of that stuff that you're then going to get them out of the car and expose them to. So it wouldn't matter then based on their training. It's, it's kind of their socialization skills and desensitization at that point, which is more behavior stuff really than, than training to, to get them ready for that shoot day. And where we're talking here about like preparing your dog for the shooting season, I'm sure people would have thought we're going to talk, like you said, for sit or steady. And here we are talking about lots of other stuff that is, just as important as the the sit and stay and all those types of things once we've got used to the idea that we've got to get ready for these things beforehand we can then go along like for example if there's somebody who knows got quad bikes who can ride quad bikes in one field while you do the steadiness and the dummy work in another field that's how you start bringing those things together yeah, so you would start with kind of distance exposure um, with with all of the stuff and then getting closer and closer and closer until you could literally send your dog for a retrieve and have a quad bike run alongside it if it needed to. Um, so 
that that sort of thing is where you would go you would go with that as you would start with distance exposure make sure they're really really I mean we've done podcasts and training based on like introduction to shot and all of that kind of stuff and that would be it's almost exactly the same as any noise any noise or physical thing that your dog would need to be exposed to is is just a socialization plan of of big distances and moving it closer and closer and you touched on a little bit earlier getting used to things running past you know the control of the prey drive we could have done loads of work again like i said on like dummies and throwing a dummy low or you know having access to flying rabbits not real rabbits of course but you know all those types of things but then out on shooting estate obviously you're going to see moving birds but there are other animals in the environment that maybe your dog has never ever seen yeah so for that again it's it's as much as possible desensitization so if your dog is already chasing a running dog and can't cope with that element it's unlikely to be able to then sit still while you've got a deer going past or a fox that goes through the drive or duck that get up because they make a hell of a lot of noise and things like that so you've got for me there's there's a couple of elements to it there's can they see things move and be steady and can they be controllable on ground sense? So you've got sight and nose that you need to be able to be kind of confident that your dog can cope with because they're both almost two different things. And eventually they merge together that the dog links. This scent means something moves. And until you've got that kind of link, you've kind of got semi-control of it, if that makes sense. So you can almost teach them separately and then pull them together. Um, so things like if you live in a rural area and your gun dog trainer maybe doesn't have the, the facilities to be able to, to give you this sort of stuff is wildlife parks and just go and sit, sit on a bench, let them watch everything. The quieter you are, the more likely normal wildlife will resume once you've sat down and, and chilled out for a little bit. Um, deer parks you can go and walk around deer parks with your dogs on lead and they're like right up against a fence so there's a huge huge fences that that your dog couldn't ever get anywhere near if they did get overexcited um some wildlife parks will let you walk dogs around the perimeters and things like that as well um ponds are brilliant so where you can go and like feed ducks and kids go and feed ducks and things like that go and take your dogs to them and just sit at distance and move closer and closer and then you've got ground scent to deal with so as long as that uh, as well as that site you've also got the the ground scent and that would be cold game you can you can put gold game out and that will create scent and you can see if you can control your dog on that you can buy different scent off um different like gun dog um, equipment suppliers and things like that and you can put scent on the ground and and just try and get them to quarter on it and things like that bolting rabbits are brilliant and then depending on obviously the facilities that you've got access to steady pens and then rabbit pens as well would be where i go to kind of progressing forward but dogs are smart as well. So they do know when they start to pick up on when they're in an enclosed pen and can be corrected versus big open space. And there's no way you're catching me and things like that. So just be aware that steady in a pen doesn't necessarily mean, right, that's it. My dog's 100 percent steady in every situation. So it's about teaching you in those situations to read your dog's behavior as to when they're getting slightly towards the tipping point and being able to control that before they tip over the edge. And there are probably people listening to this now go, oh my God, my dog is never, ever going to get to the point of getting on a shoot. There is no rush to get them out before they are one year old, is there? No, definitely not. I mean, there's there's a there's a bitch. Actually, she's she's one of my house bitches. Um, she is three and she'll be going out for her first time this year because she took so long to mature. She just was not ready. And it would have just been a horrible experience for both me and her had I taken her out any earlier um, for, for picking up. She just wouldn't wouldn't have coped. So she's done a little bit of dogging in. She's done a little bit of cold game. And now hopefully she'll be she'll be ready maybe for the middle of, middle to end of this season, because, again, too much ground scent and birds, live birds around. And that's another thing probably to touch on as well with. Just if you're going for the first time and you've never been, go on your own first. Don't be pressured to take your dog. Um, go on your own, experience it, 
watch other people work their dogs pick what you do like and don't like about how they're handling their dogs as well and learn the etiquette of what it looks like to work their dogs and what gets somebody told off and what gets somebody praised and all of that kind of stuff um if you can experience some of the job roles go and do so if you can get maybe even just a drive watching some pickers up versus some beaters so that you can kind of start to think about which role your dog's going to be a bit more suited for um and even if you spend one season going on your own and not even taking a dog so that you're really prepared and know what to work on over that summer period to get your dog out the following season um and then there's different job roles that your dogs can do as well so dogging in which is what I touched on a minute ago which is what I was doing with the with one of my dogs she that's basically where you um walk the birds in from the boundaries with a keeper and push them back into the estate so that we don't lose them because they're wild birds um and that job role can be really really brilliant for your dog depending on how you approach it it can be completely detrimental to their to their career as a as a beating dog or a picking up dog if it's done wrong um so just be cautious about when if you got offered or asked to go and dog in that it's not free running chasing birds which is what it can often be some of our dogging in team that is what's expected of them and they won't ever go near beating lines or shoot days it's it's a completely different job role that we've got a set of kennels for that that job role in particular versus if you were using it to get exposure you would treat it like you were you were beating on your own and you would keep your dog nice and close they wouldn't be required to chase or push on so it it's just having that conversation with the keeper if you do get asked to be able to go and do that yeah, because also there's uh, obviously your dog needs to be fit, but you need to be fit. And I know from my like first season going out, it's a level of fitness that you might not think you might think you have, but you actually don't, do you? Because you literally go from spending a lot of time standing around, maybe feeling cold, maybe feeling you know like you know everything's like one way, and then you go out, you walk up a big hill through a load of bushes climb over a few trees you're boiling hot your heart is beating it's you know you're sliding in mud whatever the very contrasting um situations environments and you go from one to the other and then when you get to the top of that hill maybe you might be standing around again so it's getting used to that type of fitness where it's like almost high intensity interval training where you're like nothing go nothing go yeah, I, I explain it. If anybody's asked me what beating's like in particular, picking up's a little bit easier. Um, but beating, I say, is almost like an army obstacle course. You know, if you like think about a movie of they're like crawling through the mud and things like that, that's literally sometimes what beating can be like. And there is pressure. Um, it's so enjoyable, though. The, the team of beaters in, in general is just an amazing experience to be in. You're all in it together. Um, but you can go from being oh, it's a nice gentle walk through a cover crop to go, 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 because th- something's gone wrong and the birds have gone in a different way and you need to get around them to get them back in the right place. So it, it's like herding very flighty sheep through an army obstacle course with someone shouting at you, <laughs> uh, with your dog under control at all times. <laughs> You're really sad there, there now. I, I've got to be honest, I love Peter and I don't think I... I'm, I've never tried picking up, so maybe I would like it, but I enjoy beating so much, I don't think I'd want to do anything else. But I, you are quite right, it is, the, it is that sort of, that feeling of, it's just, it is controlled chaos in some, in some respects, and sometimes not even that controlled a chaos. Um, so you, your dog needs to be used to you suddenly being out of breath, moving quickly, thinking quickly, lots of noise, because all those things again, um, I don't know how you would like reenact them in training days, but but it is that your dogs get used, used to seeing you like that, isn't it? Yeah. So I, the only thing I can think of being able to do that is just you could try running with them to start to start building their their fitness and your fitness a little bit because um, even on flat ground, even if you're just running street running, you're going to teach your dog what that kind of looks like when you move quick. They don't need to get overexcited. If you do need to, to run to, to get to a place quickly because the keeper's told you to, they'll at least understand that that means, oh, okay, I've got to stay with you. Um, so running with them is really good. Um, 
I do actually start doing that with with some of mine. Um, for my dogs, fitness, swimming, and running is is one of the the biggest things for them. We we do it a bit easier though. I do it alongside a quad bike <laughs> instead of me running. <laughs> um, so, but I have been running with them this this summer because I had a baby last year. So uh, my fitness is is not as where as it should be even for picking up. Um, so yeah, those those sorts of things is is the things that you can start start doing with yours or continue doing with them if as we're into the shoot season already. And as the season goes on, not that it gets easier for a young dog, but there's less birds on the ground, so there's there's less movement. There's still quite a lot of movement, but there's less movement. Um, it might be easier for the a young dog as the as season goes on. It can be harder for the team because you're working harder to find the birds. Yeah, and and that's the, th- the the difference in how the season progresses may mean it's more appropriate or less appropriate for your different dogs' personalities. So, my I don't normally take young dogs right at the start of the season. We have a large volume of birds on our, on our estate, which means obviously only a small percentage initially get get shot. Um, so. That being said, then my beating dogs have got a huge volume of birds in front of them. Um, and my picking up dogs have got a huge volume of live live birds when they're hunting for dead or wounded birds. So for a young dog, that's very confusing and very conflicting for them. And you're putting them in situations where you're going, make the right decision, even though we're loading the choice that's actually like almost borderline seesaw going the other way for you. We're making it very difficult for you to work in the environment and stay under control and keep your, keep your head in the game. Whereas towards the end of the season, there will be, the birds are smarter for a start. Um, so they kind of know the crack a little bit, um, which can go one of two ways. They can either move a lot easier and your young dog doesn't almost even get that contact flush where they get that. They've physically seen a bird and pushed them themselves but equally, birds can also get smart and they sit tight hoping dogs are going to go over them because they have done in the past because the ground scent's been so crazy. So you can then almost get very young dogs getting very close to birds and almost trapping them and doing things that we call pegging them, which is actually just catching a live, very healthy, not shot bird and thinking it's brilliant, which is obviously not what you want them to be doing either. Um, from a picking up point of view, you've got, young dogs that could be failing to actually find birds because there's not a lot getting shot um, or there's not a lot falling in areas and the ground scent isn't as strong and things like that. So they can really struggle to find birds and vice versa on your your beating team as well. Your young dogs could be being pushed by just the terrain and the natural environment and the keeper as well saying, right, push them really far left away from you. And you're actually ruining the nice tight pattern that you had right at the start of the season to try and find these birds and push them, push them in the right direction. So the pros and cons to both beginning and end of, of season, I sometimes hover halfway kind of halfway point my young dogs kind of start going out on maybe one or two drives in sort of the middle of the season where we're at that kind of halfway point um and I try and go on places which is why I say go without a dog to start with so that you start to learn the drives and you learn where is appropriate to start putting your young dogs out and in and can we get to the beaters bus or do we end up back at my car where I can put them away between drives and stuff like that to give them downtime I'm aware of all of that. So it's something else I don't have to stress about. I can go, right, I know after this drive, it's going to be a busy drive for this dog, but we get we end up then going back for 11 Z's and I can pop them back in the car and they can chill for two drives. Um, so there's things like that that can kind of help you um, manage your day and manage your dog as well when you start bringing them out for that first, for that first day. And a keeper would always prefer that you put the dog back on the lead than the dog ruin the drive, yes? hundred percent yes which is why heel work is a huge thing on and off lead um because if you're if you think your dog is starting to tire starting to those that, that listening is getting less and less and less each time you may be having to ask for things twice or maybe three times before they do it you can't really use a shoot day as a correction place it's not a training environment so if they mess up and they don't stop on a whistle. You can't come out of that beating line to go and put them back and then walk back to where you were and blow your stop whistle again and then go to them and reward them and hunt them again. There's no time for that kind of stuff. So at that point, it's management rather than corrections. Um, So your corrections are for training. Management is for your shoot day stuff. So at that point, if I know my dog's starting to tire and things like that, what I would probably start doing is you hunt for 
five steps, you're back at heel for three steps, you hunt for five steps. So I'm really like staggering it to kind of go here, have a bit of freedom. Now come back and calm down and cool your head down, have a little bit, calm, calm down. I'd start again, thinking about the terrain. So I'd start, maybe they can hunt right at the start of the drive where they're nowhere near the guns and we're really far back. But then as we start to get to flush points and things like that, they go back on lead for so that they don't get those huge, huge flushes, flushes happening right in front of them where they've got to um, again, make that choice of do I chase these hundreds of birds flying or do I sit steady next to mum and be a good girl or boy? So those sorts of things as well can kind of help. But yeah, a, a keeper would much prefer if you don't know what to do to put your dog back on a lead, because the choice at that point is if your dog's at heel, it can still flush birds because you're still moving and you're still walking. If your dog is off lead and decides to flush birds that maybe shouldn't have been flushed yet, that's a big problem. Yes. Unless you've got a black Labrador and can get away with it. Um, pretty much every other dog or black cocker, every other dog is quite identifiable. So top tips, if you're buying your next dog, buy black because nobody knows who it belongs to. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for that. Um, it was a fantastic podcast. If you haven't been out shooting before and you intend to go, please like listen to this podcast twice, listen to it three times, because the information con- given to us today by Emma is literally nuggets of gold. Super, super helpful. Loads and loads of training of Emma's within the LWDG, within our courses. And of course, L- Emma is an LWDG group expert and she's there to answer all your questions within our community. So thank you very much for that, Em. Um, is, how can people get hold of you? How do they find you other than within the LWDG? So Instagram, um, at Cunning Shot Dog Training, my website, cunningshotdogtraining.co.uk um, or email me or Facebook me. Um, so just Emma Louise Stevens on Facebook or Cunning Shot Dog Training on Facebook. So any of those platforms, you can get hold of me. Fantastic. We hope you all enjoyed listening and we hope to see you all next week. Thank you for listening to LWDG Poddog with me, Joe Parrott. Now we all know training a dog takes time, energy and patience, but our lives can be really, really busy. Don't worry, the LWDG has got you covered. Join us for our free planning workshop where we will show you how to use short 10 minute training sessions each day to fast forward your dog's education. Our experts have years of experience in training dogs and will help you get started on the right foot. Register now and start making progress with your furry friend today. Go to our Facebook page, The Ladies Working Dog Group, and click on the pinned post or visit www.thelwdg.com.